política. It is important that uh, there's a strong opposition that can keep the government on check um, uh, in Africa as it happens in other countries. You see, for example, in the, in the U.S., when the, the Democrats win mm. they're now in, in government, the Republicans are very much available and, and, and they're, they're keeping them on, on check. Mm -hmm. For example, in the Congress, uh, the same way in the U.K., Mr. Odinga, are you saying that in Kenya there isn't enough political space for opposition parties to function? Um, isn't there um, sufficient institutions in which you serve? Because some people might argue that if we co-opt all the opposition parties, what's the point of people you know, voting? So what kind of space would you prefer or would be ideal for opposition parties to exist fully and to participate in you know, the political life of the country, in your case, of course, Kenya? Yeah. You see, uh, first, you must know that the paper presented was an Africa-wide. Yes. I uh, look, looked at uh, the situation in the Cameroon, Nigeria, yes. in the Gambia, and so on. But to be specific about Kenya, um, we have uh, two major coalitions. That is the Jubilee Coalition, mm -hmm. which is in the government, and the COD, yes. which is the, the, the coalition that I lead. Now, uh, we have, of course, uh, members in, in the House, both right. houses in the National Assembly and yes. in, in the um, uh, Senate. Now, the rules are that um, uh, the committees in the House uh, are chaired. Right. But uh, under normal circumstances, you find that there is all the times a uh, give and take uh, in the Congress. And, uh, is there magnanimity on the side of the yes, ruling party? Yes, yes but yeah. the, the ruling party, in our case, they talk of what they call uh, the uh, tyranny of numbers, mm -hmm. that they must chair. Every single committee. Every single co committee. Mm -hmm. Yet they are the ones who are also in government. Mm -hmm. So if, if, because the committees are supposed to check yes. the executive. Mm -hmm. So the current position that we have in Kenya and some of the other African countries, particularly if you look at, um, let's say take the South African example, the um, committee in parliament that looks at public finance is chaired by a member of the opposition. Um, and is that the kind of example that you would advocate in Kenya? And is that the case at the moment, or has the ruling coalition basically just, you know, put all their people into into all of the important committees, particularly those that are supposed to hold hold government to account on, you know, the public person? There are, for example, if you have the, 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 the public accounts committee and, and the public investment committees. Right. Those are basically the real watchdog committees of the government. They insist that there must be majority. Yet, yet those are the committees which are yes. actually checking the executive. So uh, the position was that the majority of those members should be from the opposition. Mm -hmm. That is how it, it used to be mm -hmm. uh, in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and then the chair should also come from the, uh, the opposition. Yes. And then the opposition should be the one to choose that chair. But here, first, they insist that there must be a majority. Yes. Two, that the chair is elected. So they come and select uh, someone from the opposition. They're selecting the chair for you, yes. which is not right. Okay. Now, given the fact that the uh, parliamentary scope appears to be narrowing, what other kinds of presence can the opposition generate in public life, in civil society? You have spoken also in your address about strong ruling parties trying to tip the scales in their favor when it comes to the judiciary or other very important bodies that are meant to hold elected leaders to account. How do you interface in that space, Mr. Odinga? You see, outside we have also spokespersons. As a political parties of a movement, yes. you need to be developing positions on key issues. Mm -hmm. For example, right now you find that the cost of living has gone up so high because of the inter introduction of uh, value-added taxation Tax. mm -hmm. on uh, essential commodities like milk, like the flour, and so on and so forth. So as a, as a, a, a party, you have come up with a position, mm -hmm. and we said that is not right, and we have actually instructed our members of parliament to move an amendment okay. uh, to this law uh, in the House. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also involved in trying to mobilize the youth to benefit from a fund which has now been introduced by the government. Yes. Uh, this youth enterprise fund and women enterprise fund 
so that... Uh, so the point is to hold those funds to account to make sure that the money goes to the right people. Yeah, the money goes to the right people. So there need to be proper structures put in place mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that the distribution is done fairly, that it is not a partisan, uh, that uh, the entire community or society actually benefits. Mm -hmm. Even areas which did not vote for the ruling party. Yes. Now, Kenya has... Um, Ha, has been characterized by deep ethnic divisions. People vote along ethnic lines. You've touched on this um, and the danger of um, rooting political parties only within one ethnic group. Uh, to what extent um, has politics evolved in Africa and let's say Kenya specifically where people can actually move beyond political ethnicity, uh, Mr. Odinga? You see, you, you have uh two types of leadership that emerged in post-independence right. era. One was uh, the uh, visionary leadership, which created um, some kind of uh, ideology mm -hmm. that would unite the people of the country and mobilize them for the socio-economic development. Right. And the other one was the one that uh, uh, divided the people, where the elite uh, in competition for resources, created uh, ethnic uh, identity as a, a basis of discrimination. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, ethnicity took hold in the society. Uh, so those are the, the two uh, types uh, of leadership that emerge in the continent. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first one is exemplified by Malimu Julius Nyerere right. of Tanzania, uh, who created a unitary state and uh, brought what they call Utanzania, that is being, being a Tanzanian citizen. Mm -hmm. Creating a national identity. A national identity, mm -hmm. so that ethnicity is not a factor in politics mm -hmm. in Tanzania at all. Mm -hmm. But you find that ethnicity is a much of a factor in Kenya. But is it because people um, identify much more stronger with you know, their ethnic identity rather than their nationality as Kenyans? Or is it because ethnicity is mobilized as a political tool um, to access power in society in Kenya? So you see, the genesis of uh, ethnicity is actually the colonialism itself. The British... Yes, absolutely. In, uh, so, so, in, in pursuit of what they call the divide and rule, introduced ethnicity and brought uh, and, and divided the, 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 the communities into what they called the, 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 the small group of communities and the bigger communities. Right. And saying that if you people don't unite, then the bigger ones are going to dominate you yes. uh, after independence. Mm -hmm. So people began then to fight uh, against each other on the basis of ethnicity. But with respect, Mr. Odinga, many African leaders, whilst I acknowledge the historical roots of using ethnicity for narrow political ends, many African leaders have tapped into it and used it uh, expediently for their own purposes. Correct, and, and that's why I'm saying that uh, our, our politics has been characterized by two forces pulling in uh, different directions. directions. Mm -hmm. One is the process for retention of the theater school. Those who wanted to step into the shoes left by the outgoing colonial masters and they use it to lord it over the other people. Mm -hmm. In other words, to occupy the privileged positions. I'm, comp I'm very fascinated by the way you've analyzed the uh, current um, play um, that many ruling parties in Africa adopt where they know that coups are out, that military takeovers are out, um, but that um, they manipulate the political process, the electoral processes to stack it up in their favor. Um, it's interesting that you say this because when I spoke with President Jacob Zuma uh, very recently, he was saying that um, in many African countries, um, people who come from the army quickly just you know, turn around and become a political figure, but after having stacked the deck in their favor and then the political process is forced into a particular paradigm. Do, do you agree with that, Mr. Odinga? Certainly. Uh, what you now have is instead of military coup, yes. you have what is called a civilian coup. Yes. Um, you have That's an interesting concept, the civilian coup. Unpack that for us. What do you mean? Yeah, you see, you find that the same security forces are in the background. Uh, they're manipulating the, the, the process. Right. They're monitoring it. And hovering over it, presenting uh, that threat. E exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So you find, for example, the intelligence is deeply involved in the electoral manipulation. Mm -hmm. Even the military 
is in, uh, in the background in, in all these years. The police are active actors. So in, your state in, apparatus, the repressive elements, basically move in and present um, the ruling party with an upper hand. Mr. Odinga, we have to take a short break, but when we return, we will continue our discussion on how democracy is unfolding in Africa, particularly in Kenya. And of course, it will be remiss of me not to reflect on present uh, conditions given the attack on the Westgate Mall in Nairobi. Don't go away.